like we'll get started. Perfect. All right, so it looks like we'll get started now. Um, just want to say hello to everyone. Um, my name is Caleb Solivio. I'm an M2 at the California University of Science and Medicine. And this is my colleague. Go ahead. I'm Cayetana Lascano. I'm a second year med student at Plunk Health Sciences University School of Medicine. Um, and we're joined by Dr. Bagg and Cherry, who's also on the call. Um, hey, how are you guys doing from LA with my awesome sub eyes? <laughs> Perfect. Um, and so in the purpose of this uh, journal club, we're going to be going over the landmark trials for the role of Y90 in metastatic colon cancer. Um, those trials go by the name of Surflox and EPOC. So first things first, oops, there we go. Um, how we're going to go through this today, uh, we're going to have an introduction, um, introduce who we are, some of our headshots. Um, we're going to go over who you are as well and some of the learning objectives, actually. Before we continue on with that, if you guys don't mind joining in on Slido, because it looks like we have some questions going on in here, um, as well as some like interactive tidbits for you. If you have problems with that, let me know. Otherwise, um, I'll move forward in a little bit. Do you just do it Slido.com or what? Yeah, Slido.com, and then it will ask me for that number, and I'll be the number on the right. We tried the QR code earlier, but it didn't work. Um, so if you guys can just type in slido.com with the numbers, that'd be great. Oh, here. Okay, gotcha. 8469162. You're raising the game up, huh? Trying my best with these presentations. <laughs> All right. They're keeping us on our toes. <laughs> All right, let's do this. We got right, Dr. Katsanga joining us, who's like our, our kind of a Y90 expert. Awesome. Oh, I can uh, do you guys probably. Um, all right, Very so moving good. forward. <laughs> stuff, you know. Oops, there we go. Um, so here's our table of contents, just what we're going to be going over today. Right now, we're in the introduction. Um, we're going to go into the background, including some of the relevant anatomy, the pathophysiology of metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, as well as its epidemiology, its staging, the workup, and its treatment. Um, finally, we get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, which will be the landmark trials. Uh, again, Surflox and Epoch. And finally, we'll wrap it up with a little Q&A, um, where we will try to answer your questions with some facilitation from the physicians here as well. So here we go with the introduction again. Um, if you can't see me in whatever corner or area of the screen, uh, my name is Caleb, my headshot's right there. Again, I'm an MS2 at CUSM. Um, that's Cayetana and that's Dr. V. Um, and so with the Slido, um, I'd love for you guys to answer where you guys are coming in from or tuning in from, um, as it would be cool to be a little interactive here. Oh, dang, Michigan. West side, best side. Very nice. <laughs> we got some enthusiastic New Yorks and some enthusiastic Michigan, Michigans as well. And New York's popular. Wow. Well, with all these responses, just want to say thank you for tuning in. I know it's like 9 p.m. out there um, versus, or like 8 something uh, versus like 5 p.m. out here, although it's probably not nearly as hot as it is where we are right now. All right, so moving forward. Um, some of our learning objectives for today, uh, goal one, we're going to review the background, including the anatomy um, for metastatic colorectal cancer, go over its pathophysiology and its epidemiology. Um, goal three is to understand what yttrium 90 is, both as the element and the procedure. Uh, and finally, to understand the landmark trials and the key points from what you can take away um, from those trials. So moving into the background right now. Um, we're going to go into some of the relevant anatomy, which includes the uh, vascular supply of the entire abdominal cavity. Uh, of course, the vascular supply comes straight off the aorta at three or at three of the main visceral branches, including the celiac trunk, uh, the SMA, and the IMA. As we know, the uh, celiac trunk will split into the left gastric, the splenic, and the common hepatic, which will further split off into the proper hepatic, um, which will further split off into the, uh, the left hepatic, right hepatic, and middle hepatic, which will feed uh, the liver oxygenated blood supply. However, it is worth noting that normal liver parenchyma actually doesn't derive most of its supply from the hepatic arteries, but rather the portal veins, which can carry a number of things from hormones, toxins, pathogens, um, nutrients, 
to the liver for detoxification uh, before dumping it into the systemic uh, circulation via the IVC. Um, accordingly, there are a bunch of lymph nodes positioned all throughout the mesenteric cavity, um, and their names basically follow the anatomical landmarks at which they are located. Um, the SMA pretty much feeds the jejunum, the ileum, the cecum, the ascending colon, and the transverse colon, while the IMA um, at the level L3 will go ahead and perfuse the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, um, as well as the superior rectum. I'm here. Um, so now we're going to talk about the colorectal um, cancer pathophysiology. So we can see there's two ways you can go. And 80, the majority of the cases is 85%. It's because of the chromosomal instability pathway. So if we start with the normal epithelium, there's a loss of tumor suppression in the APC. So that's going to um, increase the beta catenin and that's going to um, decrease the intercellular adhesion and thus increase the proliferation. And that's going to um, become a hyperproliferative epithelium. Um, if that more mutations keep accumulating, that includes a mutation of the um, proto-oncogene, the KRAS. So that's gonna form an abnormal epithelial proliferation into an adenoma, as we can see here. Um, I don't know if my, you can see my mouse, but the second image. And now moving further um, with more mutation, there's a loss of tumor secretion genes, including the TP53, which is gonna to increase the risk of carcinogenesis. There we go. Um, ended up in a carcinoma. If we go to the bottom part, we can see that's the 15% of the cases, but the microsolitide um, stability pathway, which include, for example, the Lynch syndrome and some cases of sporadic cancer. Um, this begins as the epithelium is affected by inherited or acquired mutations, including the meat match repair genes like MLH1. Um, that's going to accumulate somatic mutations, resulting in a loss of function um, in the second allele, and thus progressing into a serrated adenoma. And moving further, if there's more accumulation of mutations in these genes involved in source survival and proliferation, it's gonna end up as well as a carcinoma. Um, typical cancers from the colon and upper rectum, they're gonna metastasize to the liver via the portal vein. And the cancers in the lower rectum are gonna to tend to metastasize to the lung via the vena cava. All right. So uh, metastatic colorectal cancer is typically staged using the TNM system, which is the tumor nodes and metastasis system, um, which is a joint effort from the uh, American Joint Committee of Cancer, the AJCC, and the Union for International Cancer Control, um, UICC. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty intense uh, on the right of the slide there. It, any combination of number and letters is used to give the final staging diagnosis um, with lower numbers associated with uh, better prognoses um, or better, how should I say, outcomes in that region. Uh, for example, T4 is probably worse than T0, um, as is N4 is probably worse than N0. Uh, the epidemiology of colorectal cancer is as follows. So colorectal cancer is actually the third most common cancer in males and the second most common cancer in females, according to the Global Can database. Um, the mortality and incidence rates are increased in males over females. Um, and regionality, global, uh, it's the highest CRC rates are in the countries, Australia, New Zealand. I don't know why they included Europe in this as well, um, as that's a continent. Uh, North America, while lower incidence rates are located or are found in Africa, South Asia, and Central Asia. Some of the postulated reasons as to this discrepancy are that there are differences in the socioeconomic status, um, differences in screening protocols per, um, per genetic susceptibility, uh, as well as different diets, et cetera, et cetera. In the United States here, uh, colorectal cancer presents itself 25% times higher in males than in females and 20% higher in African Americans um, than in white Americans. And incidence rates for colorectal cancer are actually declining at a rate of 2% per year. Um, as you can see by the next two bullets, there are a ton of risk factors for colorectal cancer, including a family history, um, CRC, hereditary CRC syndromes, um, like Cayetana mentioned, uh, Lynch syndrome, as well as familial adenosis polyposis, um, inflammatory bowel disease, as well as chronic conditions such as uh, obesity, diabetes, insulin resistance. Um, and these are, and those latter things are kind of preventable causes as well. Protective factors include uh, proper vitamin and nutrient intake, as well as fish consumption and garlic. One interesting one is the use of aspirin and NSAIDs as a protective factor in colorectal cancer, 
as uh, the rates um, or the uh, expression of COX-2 is actually raised in colorectal cancer. So for the workup, the gold standard, it's a complete colonoscopy every 10 years if there's no polyps or carcinoma targeted. Oops. <laughs> and obviously, if there's some polyps carcinomas, they need to be um, earlier than 10 years. Um, the other test is stool-based testing that includes the annual fecal immuno um, chemical testing that uses antibodies to detect occult VI bleeding and uh, positive results merits an additional follow-up like upper endoscopy and colonoscopy. Also multi-targeted stool DNA. Yeah. 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 Every, every three years, um, which includes a stool-based assay that detects certain mutations typical for early colorectal carcinoma, such as the mutation of KRAS genes that, as I explained before, that's where it's converting to adenoma um, and it's a reversible process. So once it becomes a carcinoma, it's irreversible. I forgot to mention that in the previous slide. So yeah, it's almost for screening slash um, detection of the cancer. Perfect. Um, so now we're gonna go into the yttrium 90 portion of the, uh, the background. And to appreciate really what yttrium 90 really is, I want to like go over a little bit of the history of the procedure. Um, so like I mentioned earlier with the background anatomy, most of the normal hepatic parenchyma actually derives its blood flow from the portal vein um, rather than the hepatic artery. And in 1950, the discovery that hepatic tumors actually uh, derived most of their blood flow up to 80% from the hepatic artery um, was found. And so scientists figured out that they could exploit that in order to treat hepatic tumors. Um, and that discrepancy actually makes sense as uh, tumors are highly oxygenated or highly meta metabolically active tissues, and thus they need that oxygen-rich flow um, as compared uh, to the rest of the hepatic parenchyma, which derives most of its flow from oxygen-poor blood from that portal vein. Um, throughout, the rest, throughout the rest of the years, there were a number of developments, including a 1987 study by Mead and his colleagues, uh, whom demonstrated that uh, microspheres between 15 and 32 point... Yeah. Are your, are your slides moved? Oh, sorry. Now I see the slides. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, including a study in 1987 where Mead and his colleagues demonstrated that microspheres between the size of 15 and 32.5 micrometers in diameter were three times more likely to lodge in hepatic tumors rather than normal parenchyma in rats. Finally, in the early 2000s, 1999 and 2002, um, FDA approval was given for the use of Y90 glass and resin microspheres um, to be used in patients with unresectable hepatocellular cancer, as well as colorectal cancer metastases, respectively. So after all this history and all this trouble, what actually is Y90? Well, itself, Y90 is just an element. It's atomic number 39, and the 90 represents the isotope, which is actually a pure beta minus emitting isotope of yttrium itself. The procedure is known as uh, radio embolization, and breaking down the word, radio is the use of high energy um, to destroy tumors or uh, metastatic tissue. And embolization really just means occlusion. Um, and so combining the two, you are occluding vessels that feed tumors and selectively administering radiation to said tumors as well. It's important to note that yttrium 90, though it is advanced and is incredible, uh, it's actually not a curative uh, treatment for uh, hepatocellular cancer or uh, CRC METs. Um, it can be used to downstage patients in uh, the case of unresectable disease, um, but again, it is not considered a cure. Um, it has been shown to improve outcomes, uh, both in the length of life as well as quality of life in patients receiving it as compared to those who were not receiving it. Um, and finally, it's actually accomplished in two separate visits, uh, a mapping procedure uh, as well as the actual procedure. However, it can be done in one setting as well. All right, and so to understand really what Y90 is, I brought up this case study um, from Massachusetts General Hospital from Dr. Kamali and his colleagues, um, which really demonstrates the importance of, of mapping and why and what it can be done during the uh, mapping procedure and the procedure of Y90 itself. So this is a 55 year old uh, male presenting with bilobar metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, the first image, uh, image A, shows uh, the celiac, or er, access to the celiac artery via transradial approach. Um, and the angio shows the uh, splenic and the common hepatic arteries. Uh, the common hepatic, as we know, branches into the gastroduodenal as well as the proper hepatic artery, which will feed the rest of the liver. Um, in image B, uh, they access the uh, proper hepatic artery. 
uh, to show normal opacification of the right liver lobe, but noted that they actually didn't have a lot of opacification of the left liver lobe, which made them suspicious of an anatomical variant. You can also see from the black solid arrow there that they actually embolized the gastroduodenal artery, um, and they did that prophylactically to avoid any Y90 microspheres in the future uh, lodging in there and actually causing radiation and ulceration of the duodenum. Um, so moving on to C, they wanted to confirm their suspicion of a uh, anatomical variant, which they did um, by doing a superselective angiogram of the left gastric artery and found that the left hepatic, which normally comes off of the proper hepatic, is actually coming off the left gastric instead. And this is known as a gastrohepatic trunk appropriately. Um, and it's important to note that uh, variant anatomy for the hepatic circulation actually happens in about 45% of the patients. Um, so from that, what they decided to do was to embolize that replaced left hepatic artery um, to redirect flow through the proper hepatic so that it could actually reach that left uh, liver lobe. Um, and so they did that in image D and that um, angio on D, you can see that there is both um, a coil in the uh, left hepatic, which comes off that left gastric, as well as that uh, coil in the GDA right there. Uh, image E shows a subsequent angiography um, showing the coils once again, um, and then uh, flow to the um, flow to the liver once more. Um, and from that position, they were able to uh, administer Technetium 99 uh, in order to run a single photon emission computerized tomography um, to confirm the spread of radiation or uh, the coverage of radiation that both prior to the Y90 procedure. So in F, you see that uh, that spect, um, and you can see that they had adequate coverage of the entire liver pretty much. However, there was a significant amount of coverage going into uh, the duodenum um, right over here by that white arrow there. And what they suspected there was that there was a super duodenal artery that just wasn't showing up on, um, on the previous angios. And so finally, they were able to use those images and their understanding of this patient's variant anatomy uh, to guide their treatment um, in image G. So this is an intraoperative, um, intraoperative image uh, in which they actually decided to do subsequent uh, Y90 injections at both the uh, middle and uh, right hepatic arteries. So that just goes to show that it's important to do the mapping, um, not only as just a way to differentiate uh, and kind of view the anatomy before you actually go in and do the procedure, um, but also that the mapping procedure can be used to coil off um, collaterals or other feeds to other parts of the hepatic parenchyma to avoid adverse effects. All right, so now some quiz time to make sure that you were paying attention and just to test your knowledge here, I got two questions for you. Um, the first of which um, is right here. What is the most common metastasis site for metastatic colorectal cancer? And I provided you with a good amount of options. Go ahead and use that slider to, uh, to chime in here. If it's not working, I can try to fix it too. Um, but yeah, well, I think we got some. We got 12 responses. All right, and so I will go ahead and reveal the answer. Some clues as to you know why we're going over some of the liver anatomy and the answer is actually the liver and you guys all got that. Um, does anyone know the uh, second most common site for metastasis of uh, colorectal cancer? If you can put it in the chat, if you'd like. Um, but I believe it is the lungs. All right. So to follow that up, uh, another question directly from the slides that we just went through. Um, what kind of radiation does Y90 emit? Get a couple more responses, then we'll go ahead and move on. All 
All right. It is beta minus. Um, yeah, so the Y90 isotope actually emits pure beta minus radiation, no beta plus, no gamma, and no alpha. All right, time to move on to the, oh, wow, we got a winner too. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right, so to move on to the meat and potatoes of the, uh, the presentation here, we're gonna go over the landmark trials. And the way we split this up is that I'm gonna go over uh, the Surflox trials um, and Cayetan is gonna go over the uh, Epoch trials. All right, so just to compare the two, um, what is Surflox, what is Epoch, and what are their purposes? Surflox, just reading off the slide here, is a randomized multi-center trial designed to assess the efficacy and safety of adding selective internal radiation therapy CERT using yttrium-90 microspheres, and they were resin microspheres, just to be more specific, to a standard fluorouracil leucoborin oxaloplatin based chemotherapy regimen, also known as Fulfox, in patients with previously untreated metastatic colorectal cancer. And kind of time if you want to go over to um, for, Yeah, for the EPOC um, purposes, it was an international multi-center open-label phase three trial to study the impact of Y90 and the efficacy and safety with radiomolization there in combination with the second line systemic chemotherapy for colorectal liver metastasis. Cool. All right, so now jumping into Surflox itself, um, let's go over some of the criteria of the patients that were included in the Surflox study. So inclusion criteria included patients who were greater than or eight, greater than or equal to 18 years old with adenocarcinoma of the colon or rectum with proven liver metastases. These patients were further categorized as liver only metastases or liver dominant metastases. Um, those with liver dominant metastases were considered or were patients with fewer than five nodules, less than or equal to one centimeter of diameter or a single nodule outside the liver greater than 1.7 centimeters in diameter with or without lymph node involvement of a single anatomical mass less than two centimeters of diameter. They were also had to be chemotherapy naive to be included into this. However, the uh, investigators did note that quote unquote, previous adjuvant systemic chemotherapy for primary CRC or neoadjuvant chemoradiotherapy to the pelvis um, completed greater than six months from uh, recruitment were permitted in this study. Uh, the WHO performance status of patients included in this study were zero to one, um, and WHO or WHO stands for the World Health Organization. The performance status uh, is indicative of patients' ability to perform their activities of daily living or ADLs, um, zero being um, not severe at all. Basically, they're independent and able to perform the ADLs, um, and one being that they're symptomatic. However, they are able to perform their ADLs uh, without assistance. Uh, additionally, to be included in the study, they had to have a life expectancy of greater than or equal to three months. Exclusion criteria are as follows, um, evidence of ascites, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, and other conditions, um, et cetera, et cetera, just because those conditions can predispose these patients to adverse outcomes um, and may be indicative that the patient needs more acute treatment um, rather than being enrolled in the study. Uh, additionally, previous radiation to the upper abdomen, upper abdomen was considered exclusion criteria for one possible uh, confounding, um, as well as uh, the worry of cumulative radi radioactive dosage. Uh, additionally, patients with non-malignant non -malignant disease, rendering them unsuitable for study treatment were not included in the study, and that's self-explanatory, um, as well as patients with uh, greater than grade one peripheral neuropathy by the National Cancer Institute's common toxicity criteria. Here's just a list of basically the characteristics uh, for the patients included in Surflox. Um, what I wanted to point out is that patients were recruited from the months October 2006 to April 2013. Um, and they were recruited across 87 centers from Australia, Europe, Israel, New Zealand, and the United States. Um, there were no statistical significant differences between the two population, but I did want to point out some things. Most patients in the study were white. Uh, most patients had a WHO performance status, uh, thankfully, of zero. Um, about 50% across both the control arm and the treatment arm, uh, about half of them uh, had primary tumor in situ, meaning that um, there was no invasion of the colorectal cancer, um, as well as most of the patients actually had a greater than 25% involvement of their liver um, with tumor. Reasons for unresectability of their disease is also an important thing. Um, most of them actually had extra hepatic disease, uh, which prevented them from having resection of their liver metastases. All right, so moving forward into the design of the study. 
So we went over the eligibility criteria, after which patients were stratified by these four criteria, including liver metastases, liver only metastases, versus liver plus extrahepatic metastases. Um, if we can go back to the other side, you can see that there were other metastases to the lungs, the lymph nodes, the combination of lungs and lymph nodes, and unspecified. The proportion of liver involvement, the intent to use bevacizumab, um, which is a VEGF inhibitor um, used to stop the proliferation of vessels, which feed tumor growth, um, as well as investigational center. After they were stratified by those criteria, they were randomly assigned oops, one to one. Um, and so basically half the patients received the treatment, which was the Y90 or SIRT, as I will be continually um, referencing it in the further slides versus uh, just full flux based study plus or minus bevacizumab. Um, and some of the primary endpoints are as follows, or primary and secondary endpoints are as follows. Um, there we go. The primary endpoint uh, is progression-free survival at any site um, versus the secondary endpoints included a number of things, including primary uh, progression-free survival in the liver, tumor response rate in the liver, tumor response rates at any site, liver resection, et cetera, and et cetera. But for the purpose of time, we're not going to go over all the secondary endpoints, but rather the uh, most important ones. Um, and so things that I wanted to mention here is that um, in the assessment uh, of the imaging for analysis of the survival, progression-free survival of the liver and other sites, as well as the tumor response rates, um, two independent radiologists in two separate sessions blinded to the treatment arms uh, were used to assess the imaging. Um, in the case that discordance was found between those two or those radiologists, uh, a third independent radiologist was adjudicated to give the final say um, on, on the imaging. Uh, the assessment pattern including sided progression, whether it was intrahepatic or extrahepatic, um, and whether the growth uh, occurred or progression occurred as a result of um, the intrahepatic lesions, extrahepatic lesions, uh, appearance of new lesions, or all. All right, so just going over some of the treatments. Oops. Cool. Um, here you can see that uh, the median fluorouracil oxaliplatin and bevacizumab um, cycles actually didn't differ much. Uh, between the two groups, 12 and 12 for fluorouracil, 10 and 10 for oxaliplatin. However, there is a difference in bevacizumab at 13 and 8. Um, if we can go back to the previous slide, you can see here that bevacizumab was only administered for those in the treatment arm um, after the fourth cycle. Um, and so that may account for the differences in that. Um, and the reason for that is unknown. Uh, it's hypothesized that uh, I talked with Dr. V about this, that bevacizumab weakens the vessels. So um, we don't want to um, cause any trauma to the vessels uh, when giving them the Y90 treatment. So Y90 microspheres were implanted in the patients at a median of 20 days uh, post the random assignment with median implanted activity of 1.4 GB cube. Um, 21 patients in the CERT arm actually did not receive CERT treatment or the Y90 treatment. 18 of those um, actually did not receive just the CERT treatment, while three of those patients did not receive any treatment at all. Um, and the reasons for that were a combination of com uh, compromised performance status, serious adverse effects, um, serious adverse events, and disease progression before uh, study, the study treatment. Um, out of the 11 patients, or 11 patients in the control arm actually did not receive any treatment at all, um, most commonly due to withdrawn consent post-randomization. So here are some of the results, I'm just going over here. Uh, so these are the efficacy results. And basically statistical significance was defined as a p-value of less than 100. And so the only differences or statistically significant differences were seen in progression-free survival in the liver, um, where you can see the treatment group under CERT experience um, progression-free survival eight months longer than those control group at 12.6 months. Uh, additionally, proportion of those experiencing first progression of disease in the liver only was statistically different between the control and the surrogate group, uh, as well as proportion of first progression outside of the liver uh, was statistically uh, different between the two groups. And I just wanted to describe what RESIST is, even though it was not statistically significantly different between the two groups, uh, but RESIST stands for the Response Evaluation Criteria in Solid Tumors, um, and that was just used uh, to analyze the objective response rate and the complete response rate between the two groups as well. 
And so going over these safety measurements, there wasn't much um, difference between the two groups, which is a good thing because we wanted to see if the treatment of Y90 full flocks as compared to just full flocks alone was um, similar in safety between the two groups. However, there was uh, an increase in proportion of patients reporting serious adverse events in uh, the CERT arm as compared to the control arm, and that was statistically significant. Um, possible reasons could be due to the addition of an additional treatment, which was the, the Y90 as compared to no Y90, um, but that will be going over later. Um, here is just some of the other measurements uh, included for the adverse events. The only statistically significant difference was in that of patients experiencing thrombocytopenia between those in the control arm and the treatment arm. Um, otherwise, the grade three, uh, the total adverse events graded in grade three um, was not statistically significant, as you can see by the p-value of 0.516. Um, and here, I'll go over this in the graph later, um, but you can see that there is a statistical significant difference in the site of first disease progression, whether it be in liver only versus non-liver sites. So between the control and the treatment arm, 77% um, of patients in the control arm experience first disease progression in the liver only, while only 52.4% of patients experience first disease progression in the liver only in the treatment arm. Uh, conversely, in the non-liver sites, um, for non-liver sites collectively, 7.9% of patients in the control arm experienced um, uh, first progression of disease in non-liver sites, while 27.7% percent of patients in the treatment arm experience uh, first disease progression in non-liver sites, most commonly in the lung. All right, so this is the Kaplan-Meier analysis curve of the, uh, of the two, comparing the two treatment arms, or the treatment arm and the control arm. Um, and so you can see here, this is the pr proportion of patients not progressing in disease on the y-axis and the time for randomization in months on the x-axis, as well as the number of patients at risk um, below it. The yellow serrated line is the treatment uh, arm, while the blue, uh, blue solid line is actually the, uh, the control arm. Um, and just objectively looking at this, you can see that the curves are not really far apart. Um, and that's confirmed by the hazard ratio of 0.93, which is slightly in favor of the treatment, but not with statistical significance as the p-value is 0.43. And then the median amount of time um, it took for uh, the disease to progress between the two uh, arms was 10.2 in the control arm and 10.7 months in the uh, treatment arm. And this curve, it kind of shows the opposite. However, if you note on the y-axis, this is now the probability of hepatic progression. So the probability of um, patients experiencing hepatic progression versus the time from randomization in months, once again. Similarly as the last one, the blue line, blue solid is the control and the yellow serrated is uh, the treatment. Um, and here you can see objectively that there is a big difference between um, the two, the treatment arm and the control arm. And that's confirmed by the hazard ratio of 0.69 and a p-value of 0 0.002, which is indicative and in support of the uh, treatment of CERT over, um, or in the treatment of CERT plus full flux rather than full flux alone. And here you can see the amount of the median amount of time it took for a disease to progress in the liver, 20.5 months in the treatment arm versus 12.6 months um, in the control arm. And so what do they deduce from all these findings? And so these findings primarily come from those two, those last two graphs. So for patients with liver dominant metastatic colorectal cancer, uh, Y90 plus standard full flux uh, based chemotherapy did not improve progression free survival at any site while Y90, and on the other hand, Y90 plus the standard full FOX treatment actually um, significantly delayed liver disease progression. And the discrepancy in these findings um, can be described uh, or can be attributed to the fact that PFS at any site has to deal with disease all over the body. Um, and so what they concluded from this is that while Y90 can delay liver disease progression, improve quality of life um, for patients with hepatocellular cancer and metastatic colorectal cancer, um, it may not be, or it may be overwhelmed. The protective fact, the protective factors of Y90 plus the full FOX treatment may actually be overwhelmed by um, the disease burden in uh, metastasis sites. Now, SIRFOX didn't stop there. What they did was actually combine their data with the FOXFIRE and FOXFIRE global studies um, so that they were able to have a power um, suitable to assess overall survival and a sample size greater than over a thousand or greater than a thousand. 
And so this is the headline from the Lancet Oncology Journal. Um, and from that, their combined analysis of Surflox, Foxfire, and Foxfire Global concluded that Y90 um, CERT plus full Fox based chemotherapy did not offer an overall survival advantage over full Fox based chemotherapy alone. And so now we'll move on to uh, EPOC. Uh, real quick. Yeah, we, so now we're going to. Sorry, uh, if we don't mind going back a couple of slides, and then I want to get yeah. uh, points real quick. Um, let's go back to more. Or one more. Oh, yeah, there you go. Okay, so let's look at this, uh, right? So your goal is overall survival to improve uh, kind of how long they live. So if you look at liver only, there is there seemed to be a reduction, right? You improve PFS in the liver, but anything liver plus uh, didn't seem to matter. And then if you do non-liver, seemed like lung progression was uh, significant. And now lymph nodes, you know, didn't maybe not have an end, but it's not small, it's close, right? So. It seems that extra, and I think Karthik, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on this, where you have hepatic progression on uh, this therapy, you know? One thing that the authors did talk about also is that Y90 specifically is a treatment directed right at the hepatic tumor, the hepatic met. So that could explain the discrepancy, um, you know, in, in liver progression versus the uh, non-progression in liver sites uh, and but that the, reversal. The concern I have is like, so there's probably some delay in the systemics, right? Is that delay that amount of impact or is it something from Y90 itself? That, that, that must be it, right? Because they, if they're on BEV, there's going to be delays. And why right. is it why is it progressing then? Because they're still getting chemo along with Y90. Right. I mean, that's what I wonder, right? So yeah. is the, the little chemo break that impactful on PFS? If so, that's kind of scary, one. Or is it the Y90 itself that's impacting the uh, progression elsewhere. So these are the kind of things we should just be thinking about. Right. And, you know, I mean, not, not is kind of comparing apples to oranges, but sometimes people have multi low bar, multifocal HCC, and we treat like one lesion, the other lesion sometimes like oh, uh, revs up and just goes crazy. Yeah. And it, it's hard to assess that biology and why that is. But all right. Very good. Let's uh, go to EPOC. All right. Moving forward. Yeah, so now we're going to move into the EPA trial. So the inclusion criteria, um, very similar to the surplus, included um, 18 years old or older, older, unresectable, only lower or by lower um, colorectal metastasis cancer, able to receive second line um, chemotherapy, uh, measurable disease of resist 1.1, like I feel explained before. Um, performance status of 0 of 1 is how independent they were um, before, by the Rubin, um, up to 1.2 or at album M, um, increased uh, greater than 3.0. The exclusion criteria inclu included the prior arterial and radiotherapy to the liver, clinically evident ascites, unresolved toxicity from the first line of chemotherapy, and confirmed extra hepatic metastasis or contraindication for angiography. Can you hear me well? There's like a lot of background noise. I'm sorry. Yeah, can hear you. I can't move. It's good? Okay. If we can move to the next slide. So this is a continuation of the patient characteristics. Um, I want to um, say that here in this trial, most of the patients were from Europe compared to the other trial that were like more um, wide. Um, also, there was no uh, difference between the two groups. They were very similar from the beginning, um, including the um, tumor and size, the metastasis, and the malignancy. So here can we see the APOC patient stratification and the random assignment and the endpoints. Um, here at the right, we can see there were a total at the beginning of 535 patients, but due to the exclusions um, that didn't meet the eligibility, they ended up being um, 428 um, patients in this study. So 215 were assigned to, they were divided into one-on-one -on -one, um, blinded randomized trials. So 12, 12, um, 250 patients were assigned to the chemotherapy plus the Y90 um, treatment. And the other one was the control group, only the second line treatment for the chemotherapy. Um, yeah, and we can see that at the end after like throughout the whole, um, they did assessment every eight weeks during the treatment. And at the end, um, they ended up having the same amount, like, almost the same amount of, of patients in both trials uh, with the treatment alone of the second um, line chemotherapy plus the um, therapy one. 
Um, the endpoints include the time for ram the um, randomization to progression or death or the resistance of 1.1 or death and the blind independent central review. So we can see uh, here the efficacy of the um, epoch results. So we can see here that the, for the progression free, um, uh, yeah, there's the, the median of months with the tear treatment, it was eight months versus the control was 7.8. So we can see there's a difference there of the uh, slower progression when we the tear treatment were used along with the second line chemotherapy. The same with the hepatic progression. Um, we can see that with the tear that was 9.1 months versus the control that was 7.2. So we can see that the endpoints were admitted meet and that there was definitely a difference between the both treatments, which it didn't um, cure the patient, but it really um, prolonged the, 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 the progression of the metastasis and it really helped with the quality of life of the patients. Um, here we can see the findings. We can see here that the blue line is the tear treatment and the blue is the control. Uh, we can see there's a difference about 30% of patients who um, with the progression, um, with, the tear, um, with the tear group um, had longer, prog um, slower progression compared to the control group. So again, we can see here that using the tear along with the second um, line treatment, there's a difference, of, a difference in progression. And the next slide is similar for the hepatic progression. Um, we can see again, the red line is the control and the blue line is the tear um, group. We can see there's almost 40% difference between those patients who really have, were like slow progressors when you use combined with tear. Here can we see some the the other findings. Um, here in red, we can see the complete response added with the partial response. And we can see that there was 73 versus control that was 45. So almost 40, 50% difference. And this is typically different. And the difference again was 6.8% between two groups. So again, we can see how efficacy, the efficacy of this treatment along with here. And some findings wrap up. Um, some knowledge generated from this paper was the, the addition of Sarah, as I mentioned several times before. Um, to the second line um, chemotherapy really improved overall and hepatic progression free survival. And also right side of colorectal tumor showed no benefit with tear compared to the Fox5 reflux and Fox5 global. So one mentioned before in the chat, and I had that doubt and I really um, cleared that up, but it's because the right side it is harder to um, to see when the, the screening. So when it's found, found the, the right side of colorectal cancer maybe had um, less prognosis by itself. So it didn't help that much when this chemotherapy, second line chemotherapy along with tear was used. So it really helped with the, more with the left um, side of colorectal tumors. Some conclusions is that the addition of tear to the systemic therapy really improved the PFS and HPFS in the second line setting for CLM. And with both groups receiving full dose intensity and second line um, chemotherapy. Also, it mentions that further studies need, are need to be done to identify the optimal second line patient population that will benefit from tear. So they really show that this really helps and it slows the progression um, versus the second line chemotherapy alone, but they need to um, figure which patients are gonna be um, benefit from, from this combination of therapy. Awesome, great job. Um, I'd be curious to see what Karth thinks. So, I mean, so again, we're showing PFS, but no, you know, unfortunately no benefit OFS, you know? Um, uh, yeah, oh yeah. I know Zaim and Austin both did their colorectal uh, rotations at Visla. Um, any pearls from you guys? Um, and I'll kind of give you my thoughts. What do you, you know? So, they, I mean, again, they're using more and more oncology trials uh, for pharma and even us, uh, interventional, are looking at PFS as a surrogate for OS. But we can see in these two trials that OS doesn't necessarily correspond or correlate with PFS. So you gotta be careful when you do that, right? So I can kill a lot of tumors, right? With needles and whatever, and I can showcase progression-free survival potentially, but that doesn't mean the patient will live longer. They may even live shorter from my intervention. So you gotta be cognizant of that. The, um, the only other thing that I look at, so I'm not, you know, I'm curious to see what Karthik, if Karthik is available for conversation, but would you, like, how would you utilize this data 
um, in your future patients that we see with CRC with liver metastatic, unresectal liver metastatic disease, whether it be just liver dominant, no extrahepatic disease, i.e. no significant nodal disease, um, or say they have um, some limited uh, extrahepatic uh, pulmonary metastatic disease. Um, how would you uh, counsel that patient that's referred to you for evaluation or local regional therapy? I'm curious to Karthik, uh, what your thoughts are. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't do too much tear. Actually, I don't, as an attending, I haven't done any for CRC meds wow. yet. Um, again, you know, a lot of it is based on some of this where the survival, quote unquote, survival benefit, if you will, is, you know, marginal at best. Um, and it is procedures that patients undertake. I think there might be a role patients with, you know, limited intrahepatic metastatic disease. I don't, you know, if they have extrahepatic disease, I definitely have second thoughts about it. And I don't know if, you know, it might be the best thing or, you know, provide much benefit to them beyond what they're already getting from their regimen. Uh, for second line patients, maybe. Um, it depends. You know, sometimes you get those patients who really want to be aggressive, understanding that, you know, the data is in a gray zone and, you know, it, it is what it is. And maybe they're the one patient whose tumor biology happens to be favorable with your treatment and, you know, they do well. So sometimes in those cases, and if the patient is functionally doing, you know, can tolerate it, I may offer it, but otherwise, mm -hmm. you know, you have to consider all this, especially the Foxfire Surflux, Foxfire Global, like meta-analysis stuff, you know, isn't very encouraging. No, and I agree. I mean, I think the OS is, to, you know, is not better, right? So are you putting these patients through additional adjunct procedures and holding systemic therapy when that may be the right route, right? So, and so I think we have to be, you know, in my opinion, cognizant of that, right? We can't think hammer nail that everything we, um, since we have a hammer that everything is a nail. Um, EPOC, you know, even though we're seeing PFS in, you know, globally and in hepatic, again, I don't necessarily see a benefit in OS yet. So either we need to do more trial data or not. Now, a couple other things I think are intriguing is it's interesting in, um, you know, right-sided colon cancers don't do as well, right? They just don't. Their biology is worse. Exactly why, I don't know. I don't know if they have more MSI or what the idiot, what, why the why it is, but it is. They have a poor prognosis. And I, I thought, at least based on the, the Surflox and Foxfire, Foxfire Global, that may be a population that we could benefit. But it's intriguing, and maybe EPOC just wasn't powered to showcase this, that it didn't show that same uh, efficacy that the other trials did. So... Um, I still am a kind of a bias to the view of rights of the CRC um, that maybe you consider uh, Y90 in this population. Now, the final thing that we should look at or consider is the clock trial. Now, the initial clock trial is a phase two trial, but it looked at kind of surgical resection of ablative therapy and showcased that three years there's not necessarily a survival benefit, but at eight years there was. The CLOCC trial would suggest that maybe ablative therapy is the way to go um, in that population of CRC in unresectable colorectal. So, even though we're not getting curative intent, you know, like again, if they can be resected, my bias is resection it with a good CRC uh, liver surgeon or patibility surgeon, right? And there's adjunctive things that we can do to help them to get there, right? And so some of this, because you want to go for curative intent, right? So you can get five year 50% survival if you get curative intent resections. So what can we do to help them in that process? So some of the things we could potentially do are radiation lipectomy, radiation second tech, you know, things of that nature to hypertrophy the contralateral, relatively disease-free tumor to enable them to get a good future liver remnant. Portal vein embolization, where you get uh, hypertrophy again of the future liver remnant, where you embolize the right portal vein and maybe obliterate the right hepatic vein and sometimes the middle hepatic vein, and then allow, which is called deprivation surgery. Now you're getting future liver remnant growth and enabling the surgeons to resect and going for curative intent. But you always have to think about tumor biology, i.e., what was their CA initially? Do they have node positive? Did, what was their length of their disease-free interval? Do they have synchronous or metachronous uh, disease, et cetera? All of these things will play into your decision-making. You know, Then the functional status of the patient, the age of the patient, and how aggressive you're gonna be with these different treatments. Um, you know, But that, I think, are, are all important, in my opinion, things to think about. You know. Yeah. All right. If there is nothing all, we have a final slide um, with the Slido. If anyone has any questions regarding the trials, the background, um, or anything like that, you can go ahead and chime in here. I'll give it a few minutes. Um, and if not, of course, after that discussion, we can move on and say thank you. Um, and that would conclude the presentation. 
Yeah, great job, both of you. Um, Appreciate it. Let's see. So, uh, quick question. I'm still thinking along those early identification, early intervention, offering better progress. Is there is a reason the do one for advanced disease for concerns second line if TNM is more advanced than positive? So, I, I agree with that. I think that the first thing we need to do is see can we prevent CRC? Why are we seeing so much CRC in the US and not abroad? You know, uh, <laughs> you know so um, first and foremost. And so, this is a preventable disease. So, if we can get patients. Uh, fecal cult blood tested, we can get them to colonoscopies or sigmoidoscopies or virtual colonoscopy, they all work, right? Then we can catch these polyps, get a polypectomy and prevent that kind of adenoma to uh, colorectal cancer development. And then what it is, what is it in our diet or, or our lifestyle that's causing such a high amount of CRC? We should identify that and get that out of the equation. I think those are two things we can do to really prevent disease, right? And so, yeah, some people bring out lifestyle. And so how do we how do we take that toxic metabolic environment out of the out of the population? You know, so that I think is our first and foremost because we want to prevent disease. And then as far as like um, when do we offer these therapies? I think if they're resectable, we should resect. You know, um, uh, Sir Fox did mention that um, surgeons uh, or uh, surgeons typically uh, don't like to resect in the cases that they can't resect all disease. Yeah. Um, so if there is metastases, then that presents a huge problem. Um, additionally, with the uh, regarding the increased detection and the increased rate of uh, cancer in the U.S., I think those two things like come hand in hand. If we're going to screen more for polyps and things like that, then we're obviously going to have a higher incidence rate uh, because we're going to be discovering it more um, than those countries that don't. So not only is it a factor of uh, maybe the lifestyle changes and uh, the diet, et cetera, et cetera, but also like the fact that we have um, the ability to screen for uh, CRC as compared to places that don't do it as much. Yeah, no. So I think um, we can we can definitely on any of our patients councilman on you know, get the fecal polyp test done right. Um, we can certainly do uh, advise them to get sigmoidoscopies or colonoscopy. Make sure that part is done in all our patients. Um, I think that's important. But also, let's uh, you know, try really lifestyle modifications, as you said, more fiber, as uh, Zayim had mentioned, and Eric had mentioned, um, things of that nature. Maybe we need to really revert to that for prevention. Um, and then, yeah, and then we we should have a role. I think it's just a matter of what is it ablative therapy? Is it portal vein embolization? Is it you know Y ninety therapy? I don't think it's clear yet, right? And then you have to take patient for patient. Not every metastatic disease is not a Y90 kid or is a Y90 kid, but maybe there's one lobe that's hypertrophy, the others are all dead and patients got some marginal reserve, but it's had slow progression that tumor over six months to a year, um, or they wanna be a chemo holiday, maybe that's the patient I do, like they're having a sal platinum or whatever, and they get such per bad peripheral neuropathy that you know they don't wanna undergo that. So again, um, that's gonna be the key, really, is like counseling the patient when you see them in the office and, and this evidence, right, we're scientists, um, that evidence is what's so critical as scientists to guide our patients, right? Because ultimately what I'm using this data to do is to help make my decision when I'm in the clinic where it's really hard, right? Once you're on the table, our decision should have been made, right? Right. But the hardest part of my work week is like the decision-making clinic. I'm like, man, I hope I'm doing the right thing. And I'm worried. I'm like, should I fix her aneurysm? Should I have done this? Should I do this? Maybe I shouldn't do anything, right? So, um, you know, I think that's really key, you know, I, for me. I don't know, what do you, what do you think, Zayim? You've been, in, you were in clinic today for students. This yeah, is I definitely agree. I mean, you know, I think knowing the data is so important. It gives you something to back up the decisions that you make because, you know, when people form a good trial that gives you good results on, making a decision that makes your life so much easier as a physician. It's those patients where you don't have good data or you don't know the data and you're kind of guessing. That's really what worries me the most. But knowing the data gives you free information on what works and what doesn't. So, you know, being able to, you know, analyze the data, tell what's a good trial and what's not, um, you know, come up with a reasonable you know, conclusion based on the data, not just believing the conclusion statement given by the authors. You know, these are all really important skills to have uh, because, you know, data can be presented in any manner uh, depending on someone's kind of motives. And so you need to be able to tell for yourself 
what to do based on different trials that come out and really trusting prospective randomized data. That's the highest quality of data that you can get and using that to help your patients and help yourself make hard decisions. You know, I think that's a really underrated skill as a medical student. And, you know, once you're out practicing, that's the way you really learn um, when you don't have someone spoon feeding you all of the pearls like I do, like all of us do, you know, when you're out in practice and you don't have that, you need to learn the data to, you know, learn how to be a better doctor. Um, so, um, yeah, let's see, to us, I had a question here. So, <clears throat> in the source of patients, certain arm and treatment that were receiving certain chemo, since chemo drugs, metabolize liver, and cert is inherently damaging liver, would the chemotherapy even be working? Could it be confounding? It's possible, right? So, I, you know, we try to avoid radiation. There's a small percentage of patients that will get radiation induced liver damage. Um, hopefully, the control of the lobe is adequate enough to metabolize, but certainly it could be a confounder. I don't, we don't know. So, that's a good question. Yeah, and also, um, also patients really, yeah. don't have underlying cirrhosis to the extent, like, you know, like the HSC cohort. Right. Does. They probably have some level of disease, like you're saying. And you know, I think cash is under recognized personally. Right. I agree. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny as I do some of these portable embos and I check the pressure, it's elevated in some of these heavily treated chemo patients with the CRC. So I think there is some underlying, like you said, cash and um, kind of sinusoidal, you know, uh, abnormality. <laughs> PP and PA, I think, are both always underestimated. Well, so again, appreciated portal vein and pulmonary artery too vast oh, yeah. i don't think yeah, we, right. we, we don't nice have to to higher pressure. yeah but we should right we, we don't pay enough credence in the thought process of the pulmonary circulation or the uh, portal venous circulation as far as surrogates of uh, bad outcomes um <laughs> uh, spoon feeding force feeding all the same to me good chat did, good chat going did, on did, there are you, did, are you learning or not <laughs> I am learning. I there absolutely you am. Are you having fun? <laughs> Don't answer. That. I am. I am. Personally, I am. <laughs> hey, Dr. V, I had a question about, yes, sir. no, yes, when, so lately I've been like, like in my clinics here, like internal medicine here, I've been seeing some patients that are kind of foregoing, like getting colonoscopies, doing the fecal, uh, fecal occult blood testings. What like approaches are you taking to kind of educate or encourage patients to try to get these, get these tests, get these screening tests, because yeah, I've seen, you know, an increasing number of patients that are not wanting to get them. So what kind of approaches hard, do you take? Right. I mean, you just kind of give them the bag, the fecal occult blood and make it easy. And that's what we've done in our SIP facility at Kaiser, where you give it to them and then they can even test there and just submit it. So our, our MAs will do that, right? So they have the test um, that helps a little bit, but do you, you know, you counsel them a little bit, especially at an age that they haven't done it and go, why? Like, you can prevent this terrible disease that we see. And we see a lot of it, right? We see a lot of CRC events and go, once you get metastatic, we see, and we're seeing 30 year olds and four year olds with it, right? So every diverticulitis patient that I manage, right? At six weeks after removal of drains and they're cured, you know, I'm getting them, if they haven't had a scope, I'm getting a scope to look for two things, underlying colorectal cancer and underlying inflammatory bowel disease. Not that a high percentage have it, but if you do, Right. So if you can catch that, I think it's important. So uh, you're absolutely right. Like just like smoking cessation, um, all these things are hard. Right. Just like it's hard for us to work out and eat properly. You know, as you know, for me, um, the same challenges our patients have. So um, it's not easy. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to resist that bag of chips, you know, the, the, the Cool Ranch Doritos, the Salsa Verde. I really love those. I'm thinking about it right now as we speak. <laughs> But should I? Probably not. But do I? Unfortunately, I do, even though I tell my patients not to. And like, yeah, you know, Korean barbecue is like another weakness of mine in and and Thai food. But like, what do I do? You know? So how do I tell my patients to do this stuff when I struggle the same? So, you know, you need to be a good coach, right? So we just have to do better and like figure it out. And we, you know, we have to do better ourselves at, at, at that. And it's hard. Um, you know, I'm not going to deny it, you know? Oh, wow. See that. You didn't invite me. That's cool. Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. That's fine. Why, why you miss? Yeah, that's awesome. Wasn't right. wasn't red meat and like smoked meat on the risk factor list? Yeah, hundred percent. Dude, that definitely that's, is. That's what I'm saying. I should is. go ornish. The right answer is go ornish. You know, and you would resolve a lot. Quality of, of life is going to drop a little bit there. Huh? 
quality of life is going to drop a little bit if you give up the Korean barbecue. Get a, a, a dopamine release or endorphin release <laughs> from this gate town food. But like, you know, Ornish is the right way to go. Jonas, any thoughts? I see you kind of lurking in the background. Jonas, you were to use the Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I was just walking through the, the streets on the way back from the hospital. Um, yeah, excuses, Jonas, excuses. Yeah, right. okay, okay, that's fair. Now, um, I, I really like the conversation on the overall survival. You know, a, a pretty picture doesn't exactly, like w when you said earlier, um, showing somebody progression-free survival on an image doesn't mean anything to the patient. Whoever put that in the chat, I thought that was really helpful. Um, we did three Y90s today, and I'd like to think that they helped somebody. Um, but it's, it's, it's an interesting conversation there. I, I think the, the screening part of it was also important. Um, I also don't think that anybody spoon feeds pearls. If, if I remember correctly over that month, it's like trying to catch pearls out of a paintball gun. Um, but it was <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting analogy. I might use that. I was like, all right, well, yeah, I really appreciate everyone joining in. Uh, any parting words from the, organi uh, the organizers or from uh, Cartesi or Zaim or? No, I mean, great job, you guys. You know, really yeah, awesome. great job presenting. Um, this can be, you know, really like sometimes esoteric high level stuff, and you did a great job. So, you know, excited for more of these. Like you say, we just, once you get the science down, you add it to, you know, your clinical knowledge and acumen, and then you'll be a better doctor for it. Definitely. Yeah, man. Great job, everyone. Have a great week. Appreciate weekend. it. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great weekend.